Okay. Well, Gwen, I think we're all aboard. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak today, and I'm turning it over to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I must confess I really never get tired of talking about Windover. It, it truly is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, you know, all of us get phone calls and somebody says, hey, guess what I found in my backyard? And that's exactly what happened at Windover in 1982. I was a, a new young faculty member at FSU and literally got that phone call. And since that time, we have uh, really been beholding to an awful lot of people scattered literally all over the country who have come in and provided specialized analysis for us. And that, that analysis is still very much ongoing, and it covers everything from uh, the DNA to the skeletal material, dentition, the peat, the pollen, phytolith, gut contents, it goes on and on. And we are still actively doing a variety of uh, lab work on the, on the site now, on the project. Excavation finished in 1986, uh, and, you know, as Karen was saying, talk about the stars and the moon all lining up. You had a, a private citizen call and make an effort to get a hold of us. Fortunately, they had some very good connections with the state legislature, and they were able to basically lobby for us and were able to get funding for three years of field work and one year of lab work. And we've also had external funding from a number of, of sites or a number of sources as well. So uh, everything really did just absolutely fall into place. But had it not been for Jim Swan and EKS, which is the development company, uh, I certainly wouldn't be here. Uh, the site is about 40 miles east of Disney, down in the central part of Florida. Uh, the bottom photo there is actually a publicity photo for the Windover Farms housing development. They took it the year or two before the burials were discovered. And it looks just like any of another 100,000 little ponds in central and south Florida. There is absolutely nothing about it that gave any hint as to what was there. Uh, this is literally what we saw when I came down in 1982 and looked out across this. This is where the, the road was supposed to go. And, and i got to tell you, it was probably one of the uh, sort of the ugliest, least promising looking places you could ever imagine. But when you walked through and looked at the spoil banks, you started to see amazingly well preserved human skeletal material. And in all of the spoil banks from the backhoe work, there wasn't a single piece of ceramics, which is usually one of the, the hallmarks of Florida sites. Now, this is, I think, without really much exaggeration, the entire non-perishable inventory from Windover. That's it. Now, obviously, if that was all that we found at Windover, I wouldn't be here and you would be listening to somebody else. But, in fact, because it's a wet site and because we were able to dewater and excavate in a controlled manner, it really opened up an incredible window to the past. And we really were uh, and have been, from very beginning, incredibly fortunate. These are a couple of the original Windover skulls that the backhoe operator had popped up with the backhoe. Uh, his description was that, you know, as he was moving the peat off to the side, because they have to have a solid surface upon which to put uh, sand in to build the road, he saw a couple of round rocks roll out of the peat bog. And he thought, that's not right. You don't find round rocks in a peat bog like this. And, of course, this is what attracted his attention. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, we worked very closely with the EKS. They worked very closely with Thompson Pump and Manufacturing out of Port Orange, Florida. Uh, and with a series of pretty large pumps, about the size of Volkswagens, basically, uh, we were able to basically control the water, eliminate it, keep it from flowing into the excavation area, and pretty much proceed in a relatively normal excavation manner. Uh, to do that, we installed over 100 well points, initially in a portion of the pond, and in the last two years, the well points completely encircled the pond, 
and gave us, you know, very, very good control of any water flowing in. Uh, so here's some of the well pointing process going in. Dave Dickel, who I went to school with at UC Davis in California, was able to come on board, and it was, you know, a, a wonderful collaboration, and this is the kind of project that you really have to have a lot of support in. There's a lot of hands that have been involved from the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, each person has had a, a huge role in doing this. So after you get rid of all the water, you should have seen about five to six feet of water across this entire area, uh, we could begin to do excavations in a controlled manner. If you look, uh, most of the burials are coming basically right at waist level. So you had five to six feet of water and another couple of meters of peat on top of that before you get into the burial strata. So it was a, a bit of a challenge to get there. This is a, a National Geographic reconstruction of what was probably going on seven plus thousand years ago. Uh, our best reconstruction is people were wading into the margins of this small pond, scraping back some of the peat, putting the body in, often in a flex position like this, and quite frequently wrapped with uh, hand-woven fabrics. And a number of the burials show these stakes that were, were physically pinning the bodies below and in the peak layer. If I was redoing this uh, illustration now, I would probably dig them deeper and have the bodies completely encased in peak, probably by about 10 or 15 centimeters. But this is, is not a bad early reconstruction of what was going on at Wendover. And there are other sites like this in central and south Florida. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do was maintain very close physical control on all the provenience information. And we've got uh, over 20 radiocarbon dates. They all cluster around 7,200. Uh, it is an unusually good cross-section of a living population, about 50% males, 50% females, 50% adults, 50% sub-adults. So it gives us a very unique chance to look at uh, issues of paleodemography, population health, and so on. Uh, if you started sort of ticking off the things that make sites interesting and certainly significant, there's a whole list of things that have come out from Wendover. Uh, the fabrics are pretty spectacular. It's one of the largest, most complex set of handwoven fabrics in the New World from this time period. Uh, came off of 68 burials. We've got a really good opportunity for reconstruction of diet, both through isotopic analysis as well as the physical gut analysis of the gut contents. Uh, there's also a, a pretty interesting collection of bone and antler and wooden tools, uh, as well as several bottle gourds, Lagenaria cisararia here, that pushed back bottle gourds by about 3,000 years. We've now got a couple of other sites in the southeast and in Florida that approach that date as well. So this is, a lot of these things sound unique, but this is what was going on all over North America. It's just that we don't see it preserved outside of these you know, special wet site uh, situations. Uh, Florida has a, an astonishingly good inventory of early skeletal material. And some of this has only to do with the fact that you get this kind of preservation in wet and saturated sediments. It also has a very clear indication of a pretty high early populations in North America. So there were a lot of people living here six, seven, eight, maybe even 9,000 years ago. And we certainly have some sites that are older than that in Florida, uh, but they don't have this kind of preservation typically. We were involved in putting together a, basically a windover of North American skeletal samples. And as you see all over the world, the vast majority of our samples that we have to reconstruct life with really come from the last couple of thousand years. It's, it's a combination both of preservation issues as well as population size. But this looks actually pretty similar to a reconstruction you would see from Europe as well, where the, the bulk of the individuals do come from the last couple of thousand years. When you plot this sort of on the, the North American subcontinental scale, uh, 
we've got small samples, sometimes only single individuals, uh, scattered really from coast to coast from north to south. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've been able to work with another large collection from Buckeye Knoll that I'll show you some pictures of later. Uh, and it's hard to really see, you know, anything that looks like, quote, a colonization pattern. There were lots of people all over the place, certainly not at high population densities, but they did cover the landscape. One of the things that we ran into was when you started trying to collect this database and you started talking to people about old samples, uh, some of them turn out, well, they, they really weren't as old as people thought they were or there had been dates that had resolved a dating issue. Uh, some of these early samples haven't really been looked at carefully. Uh, some of them have been looked at, but there's a lot of data that's missing. And clearly you're dealing with very small sets of individuals to really represent the first five to 6,000 years of the human presence, maybe even longer, uh, in the New World. And obviously, we started field work just before NAGPRA kicked in, and it's, it's a different world today. It would be difficult, but I think not impossible, if we work very closely with descendant communities to excavate another site like, uh, like Wendover. I think it's possible, but it certainly would be more complex and more challenging than it was when we began uh, our work at Wendover. One of the things that we can see when you have a large number of, of individuals is you start to pick up those patterns that have to do with status, have to do with differences in males and females. Uh, for example, we see that almost all of the, the dog and cat kinds of bone tools are almost exclusively found with males. Uh, we find some of those bifaces, those projectile points, are found with females. Uh, Females in general have more bone tools, uh, maybe related to some of the weaving uh, instruments used in making these handwoven fabrics. So there's a lot of, of detailed analysis that we're able to do. There's a, a mix of extended burials, a mix of uh, this burial is on its face up here in the top left. We've got most of the burials are flexed more or less with their head to the west. And on the right, you can see here are some of these wooden uh, stakes still in place that would have been covering that burial. From a, a practical standpoint, when bodies decompose in a wet environment, they tend to float. From a functional standpoint, you pin them in place, and that literally holds them down in the, in the peat materials. Uh, the backhoe, the discovery backhoe certainly pulled up large chunks of peat out here, and so there was probably some uh, what amounts to flow of peat and scatter of burials. But in the northern section of the pond, things were pretty much intact and had not been disturbed by that act of discovery. And it may have been a little bit flatter pond bottom, and the bodies may simply not have, shall we say, migrated down to the deeper sections of the pond. Here's some of the, the bone and antler tools. A lot of deer bone is common. We also have uh, bobcat. We also have dog tools uh, as well as dog teeth. And a pretty good bet that they're domestic dogs, not coyote or wolves. Uh, deer antler and deer bone obviously provides an incredibly important resource for all populations in North America. In this area, in fact, most of Florida, it's a, a very a uh, depauperate area with respect to stone tools. So they're very, very scarce, and that didn't seem to be a real problem. There were plenty of other materials around for all of those sort of day-to-day -day functional needs. Uh, at the time of occupation, the site was probably about 15 to maybe 20 kilometers from the Atlantic coast, uh, and certainly we don't see strong evidence of marine orientation. That comes from the, the stable isotope work as well as a, a very, very small number of marine uh, artifact resources. These are some shark's teeth. These could all have been collected from beached sharks that had blown up onto the coast in big storms. Uh, you know, this is almost the entire marine inventory there. And you can see one of these shark's teeth has two drill holes in it and it was probably fashioned onto a small uh, wooden handle of some sort. 
Uh, the dog teeth up in the top left all have asphaltum or a glue-like material. These may have been used as cutting tools to do some of the bone and antler work as well as some of the woodwork. So there are a lot of options other than a pretty scarce lithic resource and inventory down there. Um, manatee from the St. Johns River was probably also harvested. This is a, a very large manatee tool on the left, or on the right rather. Uh, very, very dense, very hard. We've got other atlatl parts, many of which have a broken end. And in the one in the top left, there's actually a piece of dental material that has been driven in and glued in place. So these are not just atlatls. There's something else going on in terms of, of function. Uh, certainly, the, the riverine resources in that area were more scarce 8,000 years ago but there was certainly a lot of harvesting on the St. John's and possibly the Indian River, but mainly on the St. John's and some of the scattered all ponds in that area. So you see these basically harpoon-type points that would have been hafted. The use of like, something like a glue either. I'm sorry, uh, say it again. After something? I can't quite hear you. I've lost it. Uh, here is an inventory from a single individual. Uh, this is a, probably a female, about 11 years old, not entirely sure. Uh, and you see the subadults have a surprisingly, in some cases, surprisingly rich inventory of, of bone and antler material. So we've got this one little biface, plus deer antler, plus deer bone, plus dog bone, plus shark's tooth, uh, and uh, you know, these were the things that this young person you know, took with them to the next life. One afternoon, one of the excavators called and said, you know, I think we've got some fabric material showing up on a burial. And this is the first photo of, uh, you know, one of these first exposures. And initially, it's sort of like looking at the clouds. The longer you look at it, you start to imagine things. And I said, well, Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You know, call me back in 10 or 15 minutes when you get more exposed. And literally in about 15 minutes, this is what popped off that piece. At that point, you know you're looking at prehistoric twine. I mean, there's just absolutely no, uh, no other explanation. And then from that point on, this is in the third excavation season, looking at the, the more or less intact burials, you started to see fabric in lots and lots of other places. Uh, around the bodies, all hand woven, uh, not on a, a, a functioning loom like we would see, you know, with uh, European contact. In some cases, when you lifted up the, the rib cage and the upper elements, you could see large expanses of fabric under it. Everything in that left photo, where those ribs and the humerus was, is in fact a fabric block. The the processing of the fabrics removes the outer cortex of the plant material, and it makes them very, very difficult to identify the species. But certainly they, they almost certainly are in the, the sable palm, saw palm meadow uh, families, and there's bunches of, of this stuff around. They all have really nice, long fibers that once you strip them are very, very durable and can be woven into all sorts of things. There's bags, there's some tape-type materials, uh, there's some material that is about 10 strands per centimeter, and this is about like what you would see on a, a, a T-shirt top, that right around the neck, so very, very finely woven. Here is one of those blocks being removed intact. We've packaged it. We use spray, uh, spray foam to hold it in place, and then this would be air shipped, often carried, uh, to Jim Adebasio at the University of Pittsburgh. All of the fabric materials are at Mercyhurst uh, with Autobasio now. They've, it's taken a long time to go through the conservation process using the technique referred to as perylene conformal coating, uh, a pretty elaborate process that lays down almost on a molecule by molecule layer a, a consolidant that stabilizes and preserves the fabric materials. We had to sort of play it by ear in some cases to figure out what was the best strategy for preservation. 
This is a, another burial. You've got a couple of strips of fabric across it. You've also got some fabric remains underneath the body. And this, this chunk of fabric on the right is one that did not make it. It kind of disintegrated on the way to Pittsburgh. But you see the incredible detail that survives in these kinds of, of wet site areas. And it's about uh, as coarse as a, a modern saddle blanket. So this is a, a pretty heavy woven material. Adevasio has done the, the analysis on this material, and it is an astonishingly diverse set of weaving skills. When you look at woven materials for more recent time periods, it's really fairly narrow range of twining patterns. This was much, much more diverse. But one interpretation is obviously you have sort of trimmed this technology down to uh, you know, a, a tighter set of perhaps more conservative uh, productive strategies where there was a lot greater diversity in this early time period. And again, we presume that this is the kind of material that was all over North America, South America, and Central America. This did not spring up at Windover. This was part of a much, much older, older tradition that came into the New World with the earliest, uh, you know, earliest immigrants. Here are some of the, the highly polished bone tools, uh, almost certainly used in the weaving activities. These are, are again, highly polished. Uh, long-term repetitive use, pushing the fabrics down, packing them together uh, to make these materials into the, the items that they were interested in. Here's another burial. There's some fabric with this. It also has toward the back uh, almost an intact bottle gourd, Lagenaria cisararia. Uh, about the, this one's about the size of a ping pong paddle, you can tell. There's no seeds in it. The stem is gone, and I've tried to grow bottle gourds a number of times over the years, and you can't just toss the seeds out. They don't, they sprout, but they don't go all the way to production without some human intervention. So I would probably be inclined to think of these more as a semi-domesticate uh, than anything, and that doesn't quite fit with some of our, our rather simple models of hunting, gathering, forage at this early time period. So I think these guys, at least in Florida, were starting to settle down into perhaps smaller geographic areas where some of these little garden plots that produce the bottle gourds could really be uh, tended a little bit. After a few generations, these things would disappear. I've seen it happen here in Leon County wild stands last for a couple of years, and then they, they're just gone. They, they really do, I think, have to have some human intervention. And that then raises the whole question of uh, where did they originally come from? How did they get into the New World, which is, is a, as I say, another topic for another show. Uh, here is one of the items that was preserved with one of these burials. It initially looked like a, uh, a bottle gourd, but in fact it's a section of preserved prickly pear. The, the fresh one is, was growing on the north side of the site. And so there are some food items that were placed with these people. We've also done analysis of bulk content from the gut area. Lee Newsom at Penn State uh, is working on this. And in fact, just last week, I shipped her another series of samples. So like I said, we are continuing to do uh, research on uh, windover materials. <coughs> One of the, the challenges, in addition to the, the fabric materials, was dealing with some of the wooden artifacts. We did a couple of things experimentally. Uh, sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't work. We had a lot of naturally occurring wood to work with. Uh, ultimately, we decided that the best strategy was to take some plaster casts of some of the sharpened stakes because we weren't sure at that time whether or not we could get them through the conservation process. Uh, the primary consolidant for the bone and antler is this material called Roplex, uh, Roplex AC33. It's an acrylic emulsion uh, that soaks in pretty quickly to bone and antler as well as wood. But this is what it looks like when you use it on a, a piece of wood. This was bigger than a pool cue, almost wrist size. And while it looks good, 
there's almost no internal structure left that's intact. So it just comes apart. So you have to use another strategy. You have to tailor your conservation to the material and what's been uh, happening in terms of internal degradation. Um, again, these are the kinds of things that every population in North America would have had in abundance. They just don't survive outside of these very special circumstances. Uh, Noreen Taras at the Smithsonian and now at Harvard has done a variety of, of stable isotope studies and pretty clearly show that this is not a strong saltwater marine orientation. This is much more of an interior, small pond, uh, St. John's River kind of focus with a lot of upland game as well, what we call upland game here, you know, rabbits, raccoon, and deer. I mean, in this whole area, we're not talking about more than about five meters of elevation. So everything truly is relative when we talk about upland game, especially in Florida. This is much more likely the area that most of the resources were coming from. Uh, we really don't have a good handle on what the seasonal round was like. Almost all of the burials that we've done analysis on have food items that would have been most common in the late summer, early fall. So that sort of gives us some hint that there may have been some seasonal movement. But we, we just don't have comparable sites that we can get another part of that seasonal round. Uh, interestingly enough, in the next year or so, we'll be working right out there on Cape Canaveral. And it is a recent geological feature, but along the western margin, we may be able to pick up some earlier sediment, so it'll be interesting to see what, what comes off of, of those excavations. We know there's Pleistocene megafauna out there. Uh, it's not associated with humans, and it may be much older, but that's part of the challenge sometimes in working in Florida is a surprising abundance of megafauna in certain locations. Context is not always easy to sort out, but certainly this is, is one of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, working very closely with both, you know, Noreen as well as with Lee Newsom. Uh, you know, there's some bone material preserved in those gut contents, but it's much more of a small seed, small kind of, of fleshy fruit material that shows up. Some of these items are almost certainly uh, medicinal. They have medicinal properties, may have had to do with intestinal parasites, maybe even control of pain. One of the ladies who had a large inventory of elderberry, nightshade, and yawpin, uh, these things have some active pharmaceuticals in them that might have helped you know, her particular situation. She had a pretty extensive case of osteosarcoma, which certainly in the terminal stages would have been very, very uncomfortable. So again, this tells us a bit more than simply diet and seasonality. It, in some cases, can give you a very uh, sort of personal story about individuals' lives. Uh, another individual that also illustrates a, a personal saga, uh, this is a young person about 14 years of age with an acute case of spina bifida occulta. Uh, it causes some neurological problems in the lower extremities. The tibia is completely eaten up with an osteomyelitic infection. There was no distal end of the fibula, tibia. There was no foot. So this was not a, a person who was walking around on their own for at least the last six to eight months of their life. Uh, a pretty massive, ultimately uh, fatal uh, infection that was, was spawned by the, the spina bifida, this you know, congenital problem. So again, this is a, a very sort of poignant story that also tells you about these people's ability to take care of people in ways that, again, don't quite fit our simplistic vision of hunter-gatherers, uh, certainly not at this early time period. Your mother was right. You should always brush after every meal. This is an incredibly large abscess, uh, probably the cause of death. You know, we don't get a lot of dental cavities because they're wearing the teeth down pretty rapidly. Uh, certainly abscesses are not uncommon in early populations like this. You also, and we'll see a couple of illustrations of some peculiar dental anomalies. Uh, this 
if you look to the what amounts to the left of that mandible, do you see a premolar, as they say, in an inappropriate position? This is actually erupting through the front portion of the mandible, just one of those little odd dental anomalies that you can pick up. And that's the beauty of having a large skeletal sample, is you really are able to start talking and thinking about a population as opposed to the, the isolated individuals. Here's what a, a young person looks like up in that top left, you know, classic shovel-shaped incisors, third molar hasn't erupted, uh, more advanced attrition. Uh, when you look more carefully at attrition analysis for aging, in almost every case where we've ever done this, it pushes some of your older individuals up into older age brackets. I don't think it's unrealistic through the, the detailed analysis we've done here and at Buckeye Knoll to envision a very small number of folks, even at this early time period, living into the 70s and maybe even into the early 80s. Uh, you can go anywhere you want to in the world in some of the harshest demographic environments like Madagascar and Mozambique, and there are always a few people who buy good fortune of constitution, luck, whatever, make it into the 70s and 80s and even beyond. So when you do dental attrition analysis for age, that's when you start seeing some of these older individuals, you know, come creeping out of your statistical analysis. So there's, it's a, a pretty good place to live overall. With Colette Burbesque and a number of others, we've looked at uh, linear enamel hypoplasias, Here's a couple of uh, premolars in the canines. Looking at these growth insults, you know, what's going on during early tooth development gives us a window on early childhood health. So again, you're, you're starting to look at population parameters at this early time period. You can't really do this with one or two samples, and there are plenty of those early, you know, five, six, seven thousand year old samples that, that truly are one or two individuals, and it really doesn't give you a, a, a decent statistical analysis, whereas these large samples give you that ability to make what we think are, are firmer inferences about prehistoric health. Uh, Cribra orbitalia, this sort of honeycombing of the orbit is not uncommon at Wendover, uh, may have to do with as anything with as much as anemia, which can be caused by several different biological or metabolic problems. It's sort of a generic indicator of, of physiological stress. We, again, we can start to tabulate this information. We can start to look at other samples that are, in some cases, a little bit older, in some cases, much more recent, and, and start to try to reconstruct truly what it was like to be alive, at least in Florida, seven plus thousand years ago. Um, we've talked about degenerative problems, sort of simple infection. Well, we also see some individuals that have pretty graphic evidences of injuries. This is a, a classic blowout fracture to the eye, blew out the back portion of the orbit, or orbit. The muscles would have been tethered back in this little hole back in there, and this person would have had what uh, you would have called in the old days a walleye. It simply would not have tracked normally. It was frozen in space. Uh, here's a much older individuals with this, you know, fused lumbar vertebrae, a lot of osteoarthritic problem. It's a testament to both how long you could live and probably a pretty vigorous life as well. Another fairly personal graphic story. This is a, a, the anominate, the hip of a 29-year-old male. This is a deer antler tine projectile point that the point was still embedded in the hip. There's absolutely no sign of healing. Uh, the individual was almost entirely intact except for the skull and the first three cervical vertebrae. This would lead you to come up with a forensic interpretation that he had been beheaded. And I think it's a reasonable interpretation. 
So there's there's bound to be in all populations, you know, some evidence of violence, uh, some evidence of fracture patterns that may tell us about life. And so this is is one clearly there was some sort of a conflict here, and he paid the ultimate price. We see a number of other kinds of traumatic injuries. This is a, a classic depression fracture to the back of the skull. One of my students suggested that that might have been done with one of those atlatl handles. That's a pretty good uh, tool to whack somebody up by the side of the head. This one's nicely healed. There was no permanent damage. Uh, if you are using an atlatl, I think you can think in terms of atlatl elbow. Uh, Florida has one of the world's largest collections of prehistoric dugout canoes, one of which dates to about 5,670 years uncorrected. And if you think about travel in, in some of these areas, it's certainly much easier to get around in a canoe. And I think you also see some shoulder uh, trauma and, and deterioration and elbow deterioration that probably suggests both throwing nets as well as paddling as well as using an atlatl. So these are, are the kinds of deteriorations that we see on a fairly, a fairly common basis. This is a, a Schmorl's node on a vertebrae, an indication of, uh, again, a fairly uh, rugged life and survival into you know, relatively, um, you know, a ripe old age in window was probably 50 or 60 with a small number, again, making it up even further than that. Overall, you know, compared to a lot of populations in later time periods, uh, you know, these folks are fairly, uh, fairly healthy. Some of them have a lot less stress. In comparison to some groups, they have a bit more. Males tend to be a little bit healthier than females. Uh, so again, there are all these sort of demographic parameters that we can start to, to tease out of samples of this size. Uh, the average male was about 5'6", female about 5'2". Uh, when you compare this to other populations, um, recently people have started using sort of stature reconstruction as one index of overall population health. There's some problems with doing this across large geographic areas, but it's certainly uh, one approach. There are later populations on the plains that were much more robust and much taller uh, than these folks uh, down here in Central and South Florida. We are starting to pull together some of this broader comparative data looking essentially at Mesolithic populations in Europe. Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic, the, the exact description is a little bit a variable depending on where you are, but certainly these would all have been hunter-gatherer, fisher, forager type populations. Uh, and one of the things that we see in some of those European populations uh, and Asian groups as well is a, a surprisingly more rich, robust set of burial goods than what we see here. Uh, one of the things that is sorely missing is a lot of good cranial and dental metrics from samples that are poorly preserved. So one of the things that we have been doing, and Chris Kojanowski at, at Arizona State has been doing, is been putting together uh, a, a much larger dental and cranial data set. The dental metrics particularly, I think, have a lot of promise for early populations. So we're starting to look across, again, broad geographic areas to try to see how these groups compare, uh, how they're similar, how they're dissimilar. Because even if you have poor preservation for cranial metrics, usually the dental metrics will be there unless you've got a lot of dental attrition. But even then, you can still tease out uh, some of the information that may help us understand population variation. Here's sort of a, a picture of some of the diversity, the variability uh, you know, in the Wendover population. Um, a lot of osteologists, when they've looked at the collection, they really do a double take, and they say, you know, are you sure these folks are 8,000, 7,000 years old? And, you know, we've done a really careful job of radiocarbon dating, and it just speaks worlds about the incredible potential for wet sites. Uh, under the right circumstances, they are absolutely mind-boggling in terms of what you see 
that you know was everywhere, but it's simply been missed. I think a lot of us in sort of standard terrestrial archaeology mode have often thought, well, when you get to the water table, you stop digging. Bad idea. There's a lot of interesting stuff down there. Uh, using modern laser digitization and uh, software programs, you can reconstruct facial profiles, this sort of thing. The forensic anthropologists like doing this, and this is one of our uh, older females from Wendover. I have no idea whether anybody would have recognized her in that community. I have some, some issues with the whole process of facial reconstruction or, or facial approximation. But we, we are able to do this because we've got really, uh, really nicely preserved you know, skeletal material. There's more and more detail going into the statistical analysis of the dental metrics and the cranial metrics. And Chris and some of his colleagues at Arizona have, have seen a number of things that show up that suggest the females scattered all across the pond tend to show less diversity than the males. The suggestion is the males are marrying and moving into this community, and the females are the residents of this area. It's a matrilocal, matrilineal type operation, and it fits with what we know of, of modern southeastern populations, at least at the time of, of contact. One of the things that Adivasio saw with some of the, the fabric analysis that they did matches some of the dental analysis that suggests there are clusters within the pond that suggest different areas of the pond were used by different lineages or bands, that there was some communal separation there. Uh, we also have picked up a couple of older dental traits from Wendover as well as from Buckeye Knoll that are very, very low frequency. Uh, appearances in North American populations, particularly this thing called a Talonid cusp uh, and a somewhat more common Uto-Aztecan premolar, which is a mouthful. Here's some of the, the reconstructions of the divisions that uh, Chris Stojanowski and his team are looking at that, that are starting to give us this picture of more complexity within the burial population than simply one large sort of amorphous uniform group. There's some other things going on there that we're, we're just starting to get to. This is uh, that unusual Talonid cusp. We've got several people at Wendover who have this. Uh, when we looked in the Buckeye Knoll material that dates between five and 7,000 years, a little more recent, we also pick up some individuals from there. So this may be sort of an early marker, but it's always at a very low frequency. But it is certainly something that is, is an early North American uh, population marker. This is what that Talonid cusp looks like when it's been worn down in a typical hunter-gatherer forager population. When we first saw it, we really didn't know what we were looking at. Uh, couldn't figure out what sort of an anomalous dental development this was. But in fact, it's a Talonid cusp that has worn off and it, it changes the appearance, uh, at least at a glance. Uh, these may be the oldest Talonids in the world. We're still pulling some comparative data together. Uh, and certainly Wendover and Buckeye Knoll share some similarities in dental morphology that uh, may not be characteristic of later populations. We're also starting to get a little bit more data from uh, Paleo South American samples, but Again, once you go past 5,000 years, the numbers really do drop off. It becomes a, a real challenge to get samples that will give you any sort of statistical uh, confidence, let's say. Here's not only that individual with the Talonid cusp, but this is a sort of a classic Uto-Aztec and premolar. Uh, it was first identified in more recent populations out in the southwest, but in fact, it's much, much older than those relatively close to contact 2,000, 3,000 year old individuals. It is a very, very early trait in the New World, and we might, you might argue we could rename it, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but we do start to push it back into time. Uh, a number of people are looking at global diversity ancient lineage kinds of concepts, 
but the samples are often very difficult to collect and often very poorly preserved, a lot of missing data, and there's a lot of, you can think of it sort of as playing fast and loose in terms of chronologies. You're lumping people who are, you know, 8,000 years old and 9,000 years old with people who are three or 4,000 years old. If you look at some of these, these kinds of uh, populations from a demographic standpoint, there's a lot of extinction undoubtedly going on. You don't have every early group having descendant populations that make it to the present time. Uh, populations are in the wrong place, the wrong time, environmental features, stress, just a numbers game, and they disappear. So that, I think, helps explain why we're starting to pick up more diversity in these early populations compared to more recent populations. Again, there's a lot of sampling issues and a lot of analytical, whoops, let me go back, detail that we're still sorting out. Sometimes when you, you look at some of these comparisons, you get wind over uh, clustering with some unusual groups like the folks from Easter Island who are much more recent. Uh, they tend to, you know, drift off with some of the Ainu and Japanese populations as well. So there's some, some interesting things going on, but there's some real statistical and sample challenges to do this kind of analysis. And sometimes you get some strange results that you don't quite know how to interpret. Uh, we do know, and this has been coming out for a number of years, that those early populations in the New World do seem to be more diverse. They do seem to be, quote, different from later populations. Uh, and I think it has to do primarily with extinction processes. Uh, I don't think we have to come up with totally new populations coming into the New World, because when you look at some of the places they're supposed to be coming from, we're also missing those samples as well. So it's, again, it's a, a real statistical quagmire, I think. But it's worth looking at and thinking about. One of the things that has been sort of personally frustrating has been some of the DNA analysis. We had great and high early hopes that we would get really good preservation and be able to do some really interesting things with the mitochondrial DNA, particularly from some of the soft tissue and bone and the dental uh, samples. But it turns out there's been a lot of damage. I think after about 2,000 years, you start to see just a, a real serious deterioration issue. And we've gotten some early analysis that pointed in some directions that people said, oh, well, this looks like, you know, this represents some sort of a, a Caucasian population. I think a lot of the peculiar uh, connections tend to be through damaged DNA. Uh, we have started in the last year to work with Esko Villerslev in Copenhagen, and I'm waiting to see the next step of analysis. New techniques are coming on all the time. We're getting better. They are getting better uh, at reconstructing fragmented material, filling in the blanks. Uh, so I think this is going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years. It's been a slow process, and damage is just really a problem. Uh, and you can't look at samples and know which samples are going to have better DNA and which ones are going to have worse. I'm a big believer in submitting samples and seeing what happens. And I feel the same way about pollen analysis. There's a lot of sites we've looked at in the last couple of years where people have talked about, oh, there's never any uh, pollen preserved. Well, take a look. You'd be surprised. We just ran some samples from Cape Canaveral, which everybody said, oh, in those sandy soils, you're not going to get anything preserving. But in fact, you do. Uh, not always, but enough to make the analysis work, uh, worth doing. So like I said, we're starting to look at broader, uh, sort of a, a coarser grained analysis across larger time periods. And there's some interesting possibilities coming out. Uh, we, we sort of published a major synthesis on everything we had in Windover in 2002. Uh, there's probably another volume in the works. It's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, we've published more in the journals in the last decade than any place else. If you do a, a Google Scholar search on Windover, you can come up with a lot of 
uh, a lot of technical articles in the, the major national and international journals. Uh, these websites are, in fact, absolutely amazing. They just really blow your mind when you see the materials that were missing in the typical terrestrial site. Back in uh, 2000, we had an opportunity to look at some material from a site in South Central Texas at Buckeye Knoll near Victoria. Uh, took a couple of years of very patient negotiation, consistent discussions about the importance of samples, why these materials should be analyzed, and we were ultimately able to get the Buckeye Knoll skeletal material to Florida, uh, and it is the third oldest large sample of pre-5, 6, 7,000 year populations in the New World. Uh, they do appear, but you really have to pay careful attention these days, obviously. There's a lot of people interested in these early uh, samples and later samples as well, and with good reason. This is a, a photo of Buckeye Knoll. There's some interesting geoarchaeological going on here. Uh, the top portion of this knoll has basically been scoured off in the last four or 5,000 years. And it has sort of sandwiched some fairly recent burials down very close to and almost in and on top of burials that go back six and 7,000 years. So the, the geoarchaeology is sort of challenging in some of these sites. Uh, like I said, there was a lot of interest in Buckeye Knoll, uh, Texas Historical Commission, Texas and New Mexican tribes, uh, tribal groups, uh, Corps of Engineers was responsible for the excavations. Uh, but we were able to get, I think, a lot of interesting information. Now, it's not a wet site, so preservation is a problem, but it has some interesting dental data particularly. And to warm the cockles of the traditional archaeologist's heart, it also has some pretty spectacular uh, lithic materials preserved. Uh, Here's a, a section of the, the Buckeye Knoll. This is the top of the cemetery area. Again, pretty bad preservation, but we can still squeeze some information out of it. And once we started going through it, uh, in the lab we also started turning up more subadults that had not been visible, per se, in the field. Like I said, the, the collection of materials is really quite remarkable with respect to lithics. Lots of polished stone. Lots of flaked stone, really large bifaces. This is a, a quite spectacular thing. Uh, here are some early projectile points, some banner stones. There are some fluted points here from below the burials. Uh, much more what you expect to see in a, a typical terrestrial site. These folks, I'm sure, all had the same sort of fabric inventory, same basket inventory. It's just that we forget about it, and we focus so much on the, the, the non-perishable materials, and with good reason. That's what survives. Uh, once you've excavated a wet site, there's a lot of times when you look at some of the terrestrial sites and think, boy, if we could only find a wet site in that area, what would we learn? Like I said, I think we've all sort of said, well, we've hit the water table. It's time to stop excavation. Uh, coastal margins edges of lakes, the long stream uh, bed, stream valleys, little pools, these things have some real interesting possibilities. And we frankly have ignored them in many cases. It may come as a surprise. Uh, the oldest wet site I know that has preservation of organics, proboscidean skulls, seeds, wooden artifacts, bone, is somewhere about 800,000 years old. It's the Gesher Benoit Yaakov site along the margins of the Jordan River in Israel. People have to have water, and where there's water, there's a potential for wet sites. Uh, and I would encourage you to, actually you can do a Google Scholar or a Google search for GBY site, and you will see some amazing things. They're out there. We just have to pay more attention to these wet and boggy areas. Uh, the Buckeye Knoll Report is now online through the Council of Texas Archaeologists. It's about a three-volume publication. 
it synthesizes the skeletal data we have for buckeye and compares it to some of the Wendover data. Uh, but for the traditional archaeologists, the lithics will be will be really fascinating to take a look at, and I encourage you to, to go up there. That's one of the beauties of the Internet is you can get this information out to a really, really wide audience very, very quickly. I don't know what the final page count on Buckeye Knoll is. It's, I think, well over a 1,000 pages. So if you download it, brace your printer. Uh, like I said, we're starting to look at other places around the world doing, trying to really focus on these early populations, the early samples. Uh, what do we know about early weaving techniques? Uh, certainly, Ottavasio has seen a lot of materials from Mesolithic and Upper Paleolithic Europe, and he would certainly argue that woven materials go back probably 30 to 40,000 years. It is an old technology that is simply hard to document. So these are the kinds of things that we think about. This is uh, a, an old burial from Italy, absolutely laden with shell materials, bone material, uh, preserved in a cave. You know, we don't see quite that kind of elaborate burial inventories at this early time period in the New World. Uh, so that may be telling us something as well. Uh, I mentioned this uh, early site in Israel. We've also got some uh, fairly good preservation of, of actually of skeletal material in a couple of wet sites off the coast of Israel as well. Uh, here's a, a sort of a schematic of a, a shaman's burial, again, with a, a really impressive inventory of the organic materials, in this case primarily bone materials. Uh, we, we just really are missing things. If we can handle those early samples better, I think we'll start to have a better understanding of, of population movement, population migration, uh, issues of, of where are people coming from, how are they moving across the landscape. And we've got some real interesting possibilities here in Florida. Uh, and there's all sorts of speculation about when Florida and the New World was first occupied. And I think we just have to keep looking, we have to keep talking, and we, we shouldn't eliminate what sometimes might seem kind of wild ideas, but we've always got to really evaluate them. One of the things that's, that's hard to get a handle on is early population diet. There's been almost no stable isotope studies of Paleo-Indian material. Uh, so it's easy to say Paleo-Indians certainly were terrestrially focused. Well, a lot of our coastal marginal sites are now under 10, 15, sometimes 20 meters of water. Uh, Ottavasio and some other researchers are starting to look in the Gulf Coast area. What they turn up, I think, in the next few years will be real interesting. They will certainly be challenges to excavate, uh, but in those coastal fringes, I think are going to be some real, real interesting inventories if we can get to them. Uh, one of the other things that is obviously coming up, uh, some people out in the West see this more frequently as well as in Canada and throughout some of the higher elevations in Europe. In addition to this wet preservation situation, uh, you also are getting glacial ice packs melting, snow patches melting, and you get, again, some amazing materials being preserved. I'm probably one of the only people you will ever talk to who actually sees Sort of a bright spot about global warming. Here is a six, well, 5,000 year old biface, complete with cordage, mastic, the business end of an atlatl. It's just thawed out of the ice. You know, the Canadians have been doing some uh, real interesting work on trying to target those areas and send teams in. University of Colorado at Boulder is doing the same thing in the upper uh, upper uh, elevations in the Rockies, which I think would be real, real interesting in the next decade or so. Like I said, obviously there's some issues with global warming, but it does give us some interesting potentials from an archaeological standpoint. Uh, I must confess, I'm still as excited about archaeology in North America and anthropology in general today as the first day I started doing excavations more than 35 years ago. Uh, we live in some interesting times. There are certainly some interesting challenges to our profession, but the potential, I think, is still enormous. Uh, and 
you know, Florida is, they had an old ad that said Florida was a special place. And it really has been, especially for me, with sites like Windover. That's the proverbial sunset photo, the last one. Glenn, thank you for a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Do you have time to entertain questions? We'd be happy to. Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, while you guys are pondering, I have a couple of questions. Okay, sure. Um, I was really interested in the woven materials that you've recovered from the Windover site. Do you have, has anybody tried to duplicate them? Yeah, uh, Jim Adebasio and Rhonda Andrews, when they were at Pittsburgh, made some mock-ups of some of those things. And Jim's comment was, you know, it's you couldn't train everybody to replicate them. It, it's a three strand weaving technique that took some kind of special eye hand coordination and he said not everybody had it. He says once you learned it you could actually make the stuff pretty quickly. But it's not something that appears in in the later time periods. It's something that seems to be primarily in this early uh, you know early epoch. Uh, they haven't replicated entire pieces but they have done replicas of sections so they could they could look at the, the weaving pattern. Did they use palmetto? No, they were using, I think, modern sisal. It was easier to work with. You know, the, it, it's relatively tedious to process some of that uh, palmetto and sable palm. Huh. I wonder, too, if you would be willing to talk a little bit about, um, I don't know, maybe symbolism of burying people underwater? Uh, the, the best I can say is, if you look in contact period populations in the southeast, there were a number of groups, and I think the Cherokee may have been one, that had the idea that if you put bodies across a pond or across a river, that the water would act as a spirit barrier and hold malevolent spirits at bay. And in a way, maybe that's what was going on here at Windover in these ponds. We've got three or four sites like Windover in Florida. This is the only one we've actually been able to excavate in a controlled manner. But it was something going on in Central and South Florida. So maybe, you know, the water above them also acted as sort of this spirit barrier. But that's that's really about the extent that, that I can go. Uh, it is a peculiar burial pattern for North America. I have leads on one site in Central uh, America that seems to be pond burials. I'm still trying to get more information on this. And it disappears. By about 6,000 years, it's gone in Florida. It doesn't show up after that. You see much more typical terrestrial burials. Uh, you know, this was a drier period of time. We had not achieved, you know, modern climates till about 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. So this was, uh, you know, was a, a fair amount more arid than Florida of today. Do you think that people were living near there? Like, was, this couldn't have been their source of water. No, you wouldn't think so, but we've done some really strange things in our own water sources even today. Uh, <laughs> We don't really have a good handle on where habitation sites are in this area. There's been a lot of development here, and there hasn't been a lot of survey work. That's one of the, the kind of our goals of working out on Cape Canaveral in this next year is to see if we can turn up, uh, admittedly, a small geographic area, but a number of other early sites. Uh, most of our discoveries down there for these early sites are very anecdotal, and somebody says, you won't believe what I hit, or, you know, they bring in a collection of artifacts. And, you know, the inventory of early sites is pretty darn small. Mm -hmm. There's a, a couple of papers have been done on gender differences in terms of, of status and the burial inventories. Uh, so there's a little bit of work going on in that area. But it's, it's harder to, to sort of come up with some of the cognitive uh, interpretations that, uh, that, that some people might try to push for. Huh, how interesting. Thank you.